24 or 48 hours because uh, our next yeah. stream live on YouTube will get us going on the webinar. We're rolling. Hello, everyone. Welcome to class. People are jumping in right through the virtual doors. Excited for tonight's topic. Uh, welcome to class. My name is Alberto Carbo with the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. And tonight's Herbs A to Z is on a very special topic, monotropa. For those of you that are not aware, that's ghost pipe. And uh, who better to present about uh, this beautiful plant uh, than Matthew Wood and uh, Sean O'Donohue. Of course, if you are joining us in the webinar, um, there's two ways to, to participate as always, and I'll go over those in just a moment. But if you're catching us live on YouTube, then I'll bring you to both of these gentlemen's uh, beautiful websites so that you can familiarize yourself with them. And uh, just mention a, a few things. Firstly, uh, this is the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism, in case you haven't seen it yet. And everything is front and center on the homepage. We try and keep it as current as possible. Some great offerings available right now. Uh, of course, the very comprehensive, extensive, year-long program. Um, this is a, a, has been curated by Matthew Wood himself and is meant to be a, a foundational stepping stone on your herbal path for years to come. If you want to find out more information, then I highly encourage you to click on the green icon here. The start date for this program is May 5th, so there's still some time to enroll, and uh, you will not be disappointed. Uh, there is so much beautiful material and so informative for some um, shorter but still very important classes we have herbs for the musculoskeletal system this is with matthew wood and phyllis delight uh, and for those of you that don't know both of them combined have over uh, 70 years of combined clinical experience as herbalists so um that should give you an uh, just a little hint of how much experience um they bring to the table when they come uh, when they talk about a, a system and also all of the herbs and the uh, cases that they have under the belt. Um, it makes for a really rich class and just very interesting uh, to learn from. Uh, and of course, their holistic perspective on these body systems. So if you want to learn more about the herbs for the holistic, uh, excuse me, herbs for the musculoskeletal system, then you can click on the green icon right over here. And for some free offerings, this is how Matthew Wood became an herbalist. This is on uh, April the 10th. And you can sign up for free by clicking on this green icon right here. And, you know, uh, as many of you have probably read Matthew's books uh, or, um, you know, some of his uh, articles or taken some of his classes. But if you want to know the story of how he became an herbalist, this is uh, you'll definitely want to tune into this class here. And of course, we've got another free offering, very comprehensive. Again, the free set of Materia Medica cards, over 50 different herbs. You get pictures of the different usable parts of the herb, um, as well as an incredible amount of information, very concisely presented. You get the uh, botanical name and the family. You get the tastes, the energetics, the tissue states, as well as the organ affinities and some uses and herbal actions all in one and they're great for testing yourself uh, they are high quality and printable so you can bring them with you uh, on the go and uh, you can use them with friends family perhaps your kids uh, with that being said i will bring you to other world well this is a uh, sean o'donohue's website also a wealth of knowledge and incredible amount of uh, classes but on just uh Great topics, and uh, if any of you have listened to Sean speak of, um, on anything before, he is so articulate, so knowledgeable, and is really adept at weaving the spiritual side of herbalism with the scientific side of herbalism, and just a joy to learn from. So I highly encourage you to check out the Other World Well website, some of his classes, and subscribe to the newsletter on both sites, and that way you won't miss out. And lastly, I'll mention uh, both of uh, Matthew and, and Sean have books uh, that are coming out that are available for pre-sale. And you can find out about Sean's newest book uh, by clicking on books, The Silver Branch and the Other World, Forest Magic with Plants and Fungi Allies. So make sure you check it out and perhaps support both of them by 
purchasing their book ahead of time. And uh, Matthew, if you go to Simon & Schuster, Matthew has a shamanic herbal plant teachers and animal medicines coming out. And with that, I will bring us back to the webinar. Once again, my name is Alberto Carbo with the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism, and we've got Herbs A to Z, Monotropa, or Ghost Pipe tonight. Matthew Wood and Sean O'Donoghue are our presenters. And if you're in the webinar, you have two ways to participate, as always, the Q&A and the chat. Both functions you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can open up the chat window by clicking on the chat and a little tab that says to host and panelists at the bottom, click on it, switch it to everyone to ensure that everybody can see your message and go ahead and let us know where you're joining from. I see people are already chiming in. Um, we've got Southern Indiana, Washington, uh, Quebec City. We've got California. So all over the place, I'm in Ottawa, Canada. We've got Australia. Good morning to you. And uh, the Czech Republic, perhaps, um, New Jersey, so all over the place. And um, let us know any anecdotes, any feelings or thoughts or experiences that come up uh, throughout the class in the chat. But for content-related questions, as I'm sure there will be many, please place those in the Q&A by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. That's just so that they don't get lost in the chat. Without further delay, I will hand it over to Matthew and Sean for Monotropa. Yes, and I want to say uh, um, Sean is the perfect person to present this class. I'm just a bit of an uh, adjunct interviewer because I have much less experience with the plant. I certainly have some, but not anywhere near as much as Sean has. He really, I don't know that I would say there's anybody who knows more about it um, than yourself. And I don't think there's anybody who's written even as extensively as your paper, which I think will be available uh, on the Institute as well as on your own website, I think. So it's really, is that true? Yeah. It will be, I know, uh, it'll, be, it'll go out at the class notes. Uh, so everybody here will, here will get it. And thank yeah, you. I mean, there just is nobody who's really gotten into the plant as much as Sean. So, um Let's see, uh, was there anything else? Um, oh, I thought, gee, it looks to me like we could have a um, class on our two books. <laughs> right, that, that, that would be great, especially uh, with our <laughs> coming out from the same um, yeah. the same publisher. Maybe we can even get yeah. David Hoffman to join in with, in with us because he, he, comes, he comes out from the same imprint in August. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. what's, what's his book coming out? Um... It's about Viriditas, and so I think oh. it's going to be a little bit more the the wild and woolly David Hoffman than oh, the good. Uh, medical herbalism David Hoffman. Oh, we just did a class on that. Um, so there's what's called Green Thursday, which is the Thursday before Easter, mm -hmm. also called Monday Thursday. And it is a Christian holiday, but it's very interesting because it's the day, it's the, it's the Last Supper and Monday means mandate, and it was Jesus's. There's ten commandments. He added a eleventh, which is love each other as I have loved you. Right. Wow. Well, who can <laughs> complain for that? That's like an extraordinary commandment. And yeah. you're supposed to have a green stew on that day. And uh, so we talked about the green power of the veriditas, and my friend Judy. Um, Liebland commented that uh, um, look, at, you go to an herb conference, all the herbalists, I mean, they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and they all look younger. They just all look younger than, you know, anybody should at those ages. And therefore, that's, and she concluded, that's the green power, veriditas. So, which comes to us from Hildegard von Bingen, and that'll be very interesting if David's taken up that that um, work. Uh, John John Redden, R E D D O N. He taught that he died. It'd be two years ago now. Um, and he emphasized that he was uh, an herbalist in Toronto, and really a remarkable herbalist. Um, kind of a cross between Santa Claus. A great herbalist and a Jesuit scholar because he actually was mm -hmm. trained 
in Jesuit. So it was kind of peculiar. He was really uh, ho, 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 and then logic, boom. <laughs> that, and that Jesuit intellectual training is like right up there with the Oxford and Cambridge intellectual training for the ability yes. to cut through anything. Yes, yeah. right, right. They must train up to like in argumentation and everything. So, and self-defense and attack, I don't know. Totally. I mean, not he would attack. He was very much a gentleman, but man, I mean, he really got right to the point. So, yeah, so I'll miss him. I think he had lessons, um, a school, and I'm sure it still exists, uh, even without his hand. So let's see. Okay, and so some of, uh, and then David Hoffman, that's exciting. He hasn't published yeah. a book in five years or so. Right. At least, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, um, well, let's start with Monotropa. And Sean was pointing out that the second time we met, which is almost the first time we met, what we discussed uh, Monotropa, and I had him teach, and that was back in 2008 or nine at Margie Flint's. And uh, even already at that time, and what is that, like more than 15 years ago, you already uh, were already using the plant a fair amount. So so why don't you take it away? I, we should start with the botany and some pictures and stuff to familiarize people. And uh, I mean, because it is one wild and crazy plant, especially for the Heath family. It uh, is. Yeah. Yeah, it is in that Heath family. And that's one of the amazing and beautiful things about it is here we have this plant that so often mistaken by for a fungus it's so otherworldly that unique white color because rather it has no chlorophyll it's drawing all of its nourishment from tapping into the mycorrhizal network and so we'll spiral back around to that because there's an interesting ecological signature there in terms of its medicine mm. and you know, you can tell it's an Aracaceae family plant from the bell-shaped flowers. And if you look at a blueberry, or if you look at uh, at Heather, you will see that you have that same bell shape. All the way out to Manzanita uh, in California. Right. Yeah. And this also shows its habitat. I mean, this says deep forest, deep, dark, old-growth forest. Yes, and it doesn't need to be old growth, but it needs to be somewhat maturing. I had a great conversation with Ryan Drum about this once, and he said that he had been talking with some um, botanists who were working in a forest that was regenerating from um, from having been farmland for, I think it might have been 100 or 150 years, it was somewhere here in New England. And that they were so surprised to see the monotropa coming in before they expected it to, before the forest was fully matured. There just had to be a strong enough mycorrhizal network. And then there was some, it was there in some dormant form in, um, in the soil uh, that allowed it to come back um, before they thought the conditions were there to support it. And he had a theory at the time that uh, Monotropa had to be playing some sort of role in conducting the communication along the mycorrhizal network, which makes a lot of sense to me when I think about the way that the plant works with our own consciousness, which we, which we will also spiral around to. And along that theme, and we'll extrapolate on this, so when I very first met the plant, one of the things that I noticed is the degree to which in the form of the plant, we have the signature of the spine and of the brainstem. And so we think about how the mycorrhizal network is the entire vast nervous system of the forest. But here we have this little plant that is channeling what's coming in from that vast network up through this spine-like uh -huh. stem and then bringing it into 
this flower structure that's shaped very much like the brainstem and a plant like that has to know has to know something about what to do with the information that's too much and too strong when it's pouring in mm. and so that signature really struck me right away when i first met the plant hmm. it also seemed like it's kind of reducing the lessons of being alive to the most minimal um, level kind of like the spirit or the soul uh, it's gotten rid of all the green and the liveliness Oh, we were talking about the green power. This is one that's not the green power. <laughs> right. It's a slightly long story, but it comes naturally from that, about my very first meeting with the plant. Um, oh, well, let's hear it. And so um, I was just coming back from learning from Stephen Buhner. He had come out to do one of his many last workshops uh, at um, on <laughs> Rosemary Gladstar's land in Vermont. And I, I was really, really deeply moved and deeply impacted by it. And I really took his lessons very seriously. And like so many people went, went and learned from him and found that it was very, a, a beautiful thing to bring your attention to, and your gratitude to your heartbeat and to notice the way that shifted perception. But then sort of thought, oh, well, that was a cool experience. And mm -hmm. I really took it seriously and began practicing it every day. And about a month after that, as I was doing that daily practice, walking through the forest with my attention coming back again and again to my heartbeat and to my, uh, and my gratitude coming again and again to my heartbeat, and then expanding outward to see who wanted to connect with me, I was walking down this logging road in Maine, and all of a sudden, I saw Ghost Pipe, which I had never seen before. Mm. I had heard of it from uh, Tommy Priester in Boston, and so mm. I knew a tiny bit about it, but I um, had never seen it in person before, and I only knew the very, the very, the very least bit. And the little bit that I knew about it was about only the root. Was about you about the root being used as the medicine. Hmm. But I got down there on the ground and was really calling my attention. And I ate a single one of the flowers at the plant's direction. Mm -hmm. And there is a very, very strong acrid sensation in the back of the throat, like almost as strong as the acridity of lobelia when oh, you what? eat the flower fresh. Mm. Uh, Kind of like if you had a lobelia salad, because there's also it's also has that sort of watery taste of eating fresh greens, but uh, that strong, strong acridity. And mm -hmm. as I rose up and started walking, after listening to the plant for a little while, I started thinking, oh, wait a second, I don't know if that was such a good idea. That was a strange sensation in the back of my throat. And I know people use the root, but I've never heard of anybody working with the flower. And maybe that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> and But it was just sort of at that very flat like level of just like, oh, I'm noticing that maybe this might not have been wise. <laughs> and I continued walking, and I started thinking, well, I actually don't know. Maybe this is poisonous. <laughs> huh. It might be poisonous, or it might not. <laughs> and then I began thinking, well, I wonder if I'm going to die. Um, <laughs> nobody really comes down this road very much. And if I died, I might just fall over into the ditch and then rot into the soil. And then my mind would be part of the mind of the forest. <laughs> and... It might be nice to be part of the mind of the forest. That could be really beautiful. But I don't, but there are, it would be kind of a shame because there are a lot of things I want to do. I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. I might die. I don't want to die, but I might. And I kept walking. And finally, I got back to the house. Uh, it was about seven miles. And when I got back to the house, I pulled out. Um, 
a field guide because I didn't really have very many herb books at the time. And the field guides, of course, are written with the legal section <laughs> department of the <laughs> very much involved. And it said, warning, potentially deadly, contains cardiac glycosides, safety unknown. And then I start, the whole thing's where I started again. I was like, oh, well, I might die. Um, yeah, cardiac glycosides, that would be bad. But when did I eat it? Oh, it was a little while ago. So if I was going to die, probably be dying already. If I call 911, it's going to be 45 minutes before an ambulance can get out here. Uh, really no point. I hope I don't die, but I might die. <laughs> and then a while passed and I realized I wasn't going to die. And then uh, yeah. the next day I went and I found Ryan Drum's writing and he talked about one time he ate an entire ounce of the fresh plant and had wow. a slight upset stomach. So I felt like, okay, this is much safer than we thought. And, um, yeah, and there were really two things in that. And one was, in the wake of that, I kept musing on one of the things that Stephen talked about and that he really lived in those last years of his life was saying that if you want to work with healing people, you can't treat death as your adversary. You have to walk beside death. Because if you haven't walked beside death, you can't walk beside people in their healing. And I felt like, oh, this was a really profound initiation in beginning to understand that. And the second piece was that that was when I first began to realize that the neurological effects could be had from the upright parts, that you didn't need to go to the roots. And that you could pull up the upright parts without needing to pull up the roots. And so ever since then, I've worked only with the flower and the stem of the plant, and only very sparingly, um, only harvesting a few from each cluster. And I see them come back in that same cluster every year uh, when I do that, um, mm -hmm. and only taking it, only taking what I need for the year and only using it when nothing else will do. And um, I also learned the hard way not to even hint at what forest I'm gathering it from, because no matter how many warnings you give to people, they will still go and completely deplete stands of it. Yeah, Sean is referring to this being a <clears throat> environmentally challenged, although there are certainly places in the wilderness, I would say, and even sometimes in the <clears throat> kind of close in more tame wilderness where you'll see i don't want to say fields of it but just i can't say acres of it but <clears throat> where you just see it everywhere um on that forest floor and... yeah and those are the places i gather and those those populations can be quite healthy i'm yeah. not even so, so sure that like under the official threatened and endangered rules it falls but there's absolutely no way of cultivating it and yeah. there's so much pain in our culture that if people were out wild harvesting it, it would very quickly, uh, on a sort of commercial scale, it would very quickly get completely wiped out. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, the custom in herbalism has shifted from the use of the roots to the use of the above-ground parts now. And so that's a major shift over the last 25, 20, 25 years, because everybody's trying to be environmental about it. So, and the roots are, look like a bunch of little sticks kind of with a bunch of soil in it. It's kind of funny. And it could, they usually come out pretty easily, but uh, it's not what we pick anymore. So, right. yeah. And I think that at the point that I started working with the plant, Ryan Drum and I were the only ones who were really working with. Oh. This time in the flower. Oh, oh, okay. Uh well now I think that's the custom. I looked uh I looked online to see what was for sale and so on. Almost everybody is doing the the uh flower. So have you published much or is this just spread through 
herbal community. Have well, you... I, I had published stuff years ago, and then there was... And then there were a number of articles that people wrote about being afraid about too many people knowing about it. And so I, I felt guilty and I impulsively deleted everything I had written about it yeah. and uh, have really just in the past couple of years come back to writing and speaking about the plant again. So there was one, there was one piece I wrote for the AHG that stayed up online and, um, I also wrote a little bit about it in my upcoming book, but in the book, I really only talk about making the flower essence because oh, I just it. don't want to talk with people too directly if I can't give the whole story about how sensitive it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good idea, doing the flower essence. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, yes, totally remarkable. What's that called? Saprophytic, when it feeds off the uh, roots of it, it has a close relationship through the roots with the host plant and then the mycorrhizae all through the forest floor. So so you do see it in these kind of little plantations of like, again, not an acre, but I don't know, 30, 50 feet of it, and then a break, and then maybe another patch of it that's bigger or small, that's a little smaller, or maybe or as big. So that's kind of what you see. And uh, I don't know, we won't give the time of the year to go out there and look. You'll, <laughs> you'll just have to be such a forest person that you figure that out on your own. And what so, I find is when the plant wants to work with you, when you find the one or two individual sentinel plants will be growing right along the path and begin to ask them if the plant actually wants to be harvested, you'll begin seeing the pattern of where the next ones will show up. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, so let's see. Um, I think there's already some signatures and some ideas. Well, first, it is a plant that does walk with death. And it is, um, you know, so on the path of being an ordinary person or a shaman or spiritually oriented, we do need to recapitulate our experiences and uh, this plant seems to be able to help a person relive things without the trauma, without the deep trauma, go through it. And so it does kind of come close to death in that sense. Plus, I have a few cases, I've used it more, where people were going to pass over and they needed to kind of deal with that fact and accept death. And then I had a case where the dog seemed to be dying. We didn't really know what was going on and the vet the vets wanted to put it down and i had sent that family some ghost pipe and they didn't have a lot of herbs so i said well and they said well it seems to be dying we can't really tell we don't know what's going on neither does the vet so i said well I'll give it some monotropa and it completely turned back to normal in like two days it was healthy again so so it has a kind of organizational it may organize on the physical level as well as the mental, emotional, spiritual level as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So, why don't you go into using it? You've just had dramatic. I mean, there's very few. I think you said there's so much pain, but what's remarkable about this plant is how much it could really help society. Uh, we live in a very, very painful, disorganized era. So, it's well suited to the time. So, let me turn yeah. it back to you here. Yeah. It is so interesting the way that it works with pain. I remember when I very, I can still hear the words that Tommy Priester said when he was first talking about it, which I think were based on things he had learned from David Winston as well as from his own experience. Yeah. And he was saying, it's not that it makes the pain go away, but it puts you beside the pain. And when you're beside the pain, you can have a different relationship with it. And having that different relationship with it, you begin to realize that, okay, I can make it through this. And so I've tended to, to reserve it with physical pain for really extreme circumstances where nothing else is going to do. 
the person is thinking about going to the hospital for for opioids uh at that point and um i find that it combines very nicely for physical pain with cannabis with the chinese corydalis corydalis yan huso which has kind of a fluid feeling in the way that it spreads across the nervous system um once I did combine it with a tincture of um, of poppy heads, and found when somebody was in very extreme pain, and found it very useful in that regard. Mm -hmm. And so when I began to um, when I was first gathering it, uh, was at the point when you know very early in my practice most of what I did was first aid at festivals. And so I thought, okay, here's a great local pain medicine I can begin working with. It'll be good to have a bunch of this on hand. And the very first day, night that I was tincturing it, uh, there were some people over for dinner. And tincturing ghost pipe is a lot of fun for, to watch because once you pour the alcohol over it, within a very short time, the color of the alcohol begins to change and first will be a light violet and then it'll go all the way to a like deep, almost black, inky color. Um, and so quite striking. And even though I do like to let it sit for the full month or so that I normally would with the tincture, I do find that in a pinch, once it's turned that inky color, um, it will begin to have some effect. And that very first night that I was making it, uh, and people were watching it, uh, one of the people who was over um, was asking a lot of questions and heard me say that it was about that it was there for pain, and then went out and gathered some herself and made the tincture. In a short while after that, she had a mutual friend staying with her. And she went out for a little while and she came back and he was in a near catatonic state, rocking back and forth. And she kept asking him, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he said, the pain, the pain. And she assumed he was in excruciating physical pain. So she gave him ghost pipe. And within a very short time, his orientation returned and his ability to speak returned and he explained that he had actually just received horrible news about somebody very close to him and that it was the emotional pain but uh she brought him right over to see me then and he said as soon as i took it it was like everything that i was worried about was right in front of me but wasn't part of me and I could see it, and I could work with it. And that was when a light bulb went off for me about, oh, this emotion, this is working at a different level than what we normally think of with pain relief, because it has to be working with the way we're processing it, because the way that we process emotional pain is not different from the way we process physical pain. Our bodies uh, never quite caught on to the idea of the mind-body separation. <laughs> and so our nervous systems are just processing 